Welcome to the Moss Report with your host, Dr. Ralph W. Moss. Hi, this is Ralph Moss for Moss Report. And today I have the great pleasure and honor of speaking to Dr. and Professor Michael J. Gonzalez of, uh, from the School of Public Health, Department of Human Development, University of Puerto Rico in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And uh, Dr. Gonzalez is uh, an eminent uh, figure in the field of complementary medicine with multiple degrees from outstanding universities and a uh, uh, author of over 150 scientific publications. And he serves on the editorial board of, of numerous uh, journals and is a consultant and basically has just done an amazing body of work uh, that we want to talk to him about uh, today. Uh, so welcome to the program. Thank you, Dr. Moss. Let me tell you that you should know that you've been very inspiring to me. So I was inspired in, in, in your work, especially that book on questioning chemotherapy uh, has really uh, made a difference in my career. So That's great. And also, I mean, it's odd that you and I, our, our paths have sort of crossed over the years. And more than that, um, our interests have been very similar. And just sort of fate has kind of put us together. I think we're, our, our minds must work in similar ways. We both have two heroes, two mentors and heroes that we share in common. One of them is Albert St. Georgie, we were just uh, before the show we're talking about, uh, who um, discovered the, uh, the chemical nature of vitamin C and named it ascorbic acid and won the 1937 Nobel Prize for that discovery and other discoveries. And I, I, I wrote his biography, Free Radical, um, and was associated with him for six years uh, in doing so. And you were just telling me that you met him when he came to Puerto Rico. I had a chance to see him talk and ask him a question when he was presenting at the School of Medicine in Ponce, Puerto Rico. Uh -huh. And it was very inspiring to me at that point of time. I was starting to learn about Dr. Pauling, Dr. Cameron. I had a chance to also, I was a good friend of Brian Labowitz. Oh, really? Who was part of that original paper of vitamin C and cancer, that yes. review that Dr. Pauling and Cameron did in 1979. Yes. And you met, and you met uh, uh, Dr. Pauling, right? I did meet Dr. Pauling in Oklahoma in 1992. I remember his first words when I approached him. I was all scared. It's like a, a, a young person today meeting uh, LeBron James or something like that, you know, <laughs> or, and I thought, you know, he, he's a two-time Nobel Prize. I don't know how kind of a, I approach him, you know. I'm just a mm -hmm. kid from born in the Bronx, New York, and from Puerto Rico. So, <laughs> but when I came to him and said, Dr. Pan, do you have a minute? And he said, come on, sit down. I have all the time of the world. I'm retired. <laughs> so he was a funny guy, too. He was funny. I had a chance to talk to him for about an hour and a half about my ideas about Listen. vitamin D about oxidation, man, that was really inspiring to me. I, I remember like it was yesterday. Me so. too. I, I was at that same meeting. Um, and I, I, I remember, I have a picture of it actually on my wall as we're, as we're speaking. You know that I do too. I have a picture of him on my wall. I'm looking at it right now. So, But I have a picture from that meeting from, as I'm standing there looking, you know, holding a coffee or you know, holding a coffee cup. It's not the greatest picture, but um <laughs> You know, and he, it was so very memorable. And you remember he came, the first thing he said in his lecture was, they told me I had to have slides. Uh, you he know, brought one. one. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. He, gave, he, he put up one slide on the screen and then they just talked for, the, for another hour after that. So that was very, you know, many memorable things about that. About it. Of course, I think he already had prostate cancer at that time, and he, he passed away um, not too far, too long after that. But uh, he was a he was a remarkable human being, and enormous courage, as you'd imagine, for somebody who, you know, was given an award by John Kennedy. Um, I forget what the, the occasion, oh yes, the Kennedys invited all the American Nobel laureates to the White House, and he came 
and, and then excused himself and went outside and joined a picket line around the White House in his tuxedo. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, let, yeah, let me tell yeah. you, I don't think I don't think many of the physicians that criticized Dr. Pauli really understood his greatness. That's true. He was well, the first one in 1949 talking about molecular medicine. I mean, he was uh -huh. he was he was really really an incredible guy. Yeah, they didn't ever forgive him for the fact that you know he was a physicist and a chemist uh, and not a medical doctor. And that was in those days. If you weren't an MD and you know weren't part still of today, the, still today, still today. It's still you're a second. You're definitely a second class citizen, even though you have multiple advanced degrees, amazing resume. But unless you have that MD, you could you could you know they say what do you call the person who graduates last in his class from medical school? Doctor. So it's like you know if you if you have that medical degree, it makes a world of difference. But there's you, a thing of that Daniel Bornstein that says that. Uh... Uh, discovery, it's its not a matter of ignorance, but uh, its not, the problem is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge. And I think mm -hmm. they suffer from that illusion of knowledge. Yes, yes. So we've seen a lot of that, you and I. I mean, over the past 20-odd uh, years, we've, se we've seen vitamin C, ascorbic acid, um, uh, at the depths of rejection and almost, almost uh, complete... Uh, complete avoidance uh, within the medical society um, to a new level of, of validation and acceptance. And I'd kind of like you to talk about that. Uh, I have been, of course, reviewing for our conversation, reviewing a lot of your papers and your work um, on this. But I think I, you know, I'd rather have you give you the chance to sort of expound on this and um, basically I was looking at uh, a, a number of articles that you have done. Uh, the one that really caught my eye the most was the, the letter in Integrative Cancer Therapies from 2006 that begins with a quotation from Dr. Albert St. Georgi that discovery is seeing what everybody has seen and thinking what nobody else has thought. And that kind of summarizes your, your approach and your contribution. Um, but I'd like to sort of go back, and a lot of our listeners, I'm sure, are, were maybe they were they're too young to even remember the fierceness of the controversy over vitamin C and what was done to to Pauling, um, and then bring that up to date with you know with the latest findings. I mean, you, you say in this paper, in this it was a, a letter, I believe, or yeah, a letter to the editor. You say that. You know, the classic controversy was between Linus Pauling and Charles Mortel of the Mayo Clinic. And uh, the Mortel study on vitamin C um, basically destroyed uh, the, the growing movement towards using high dose intravenous vitamin C for a generation. Um, I, I got a call uh, shortly after the Mortel paper was published, I got a call out of the blue from Linus Pauling. And I remember he said to me, I don't say, he said, I don't say this lightly about a colleague, but this was a fraudulent paper. So Pauling's belief, at least as he conveyed it to me, wasn't, this was not an error that was made. That Mortel, who was called Dr. Debunker, that was his nickname, that he had gone out to come up with a negative result, and he did. Um, so what is your view on that? Oh, I, I'm I'm totally I totally uh, in accordance with that idea because I I know that I was looking at that paper it was done so oh, so badly that you see that it was done it was not you know it was given orally there were no IV and also it was not given you know consistently so it was a it was really a paper to debunk vitamin C it was yes. probably just set for that. Uh, uh and also, the thing you know, is that uh, they, okay. they never did the thing that they did at the at the hospital in Scotland. It, it was something totally different, and yeah. uh, and you know I, I think one of the problems with vitamin C it's 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 a it's a nutrient, it's a vitamin. So you know the, the physician train for in terms of pharmaceutical things being the strongest things and being the things that work. 
So they don't have a, they, they cannot imagine how a vitamin can have pharmacological properties or how a vitamin can have a variety of functions that may uh, a pleiotrophic effect in the body. And they don't understand vitamin C at all. I mean, there will not be life in this earth without vitamin C because mm -hmm. vitamin C is a very important uh, oxidation reduction molecule that moves electrons in photosynthesis. There, were, there would have been no photosynthesis if there was no vitamin, vitamin C. And that was, it's not said just by me. It was said by uh, Dr. Uh, St. Georgi. And St. Georgi was the first one to really understand all the bioenergetics involved with, with the molecule of vitamin C, which is very similar to glucose. So it's, a, it's kind of a universal molecule. And it's, mm -hmm. it's in every place. And it's, it's, it's really, that's its job. It's to move electrons around. We have even seen that it has an ergogenic effect. It could be an antioxidant in occasions. It could be a peroxidant in others. It just, mm -hmm. it, it just tells you about the versatility of the molecule of vitamin C. And I think Dr. Pauling really started to look into that. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he found in very important data on, in terms of vitamin C working against cancer, working against infectious disease, working against the common cold, and right now, the only thing that's really working to help people, it's, it's vitamin C in large doses against this uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 SARS -CoV virus. And the thing is that uh, vitamin C can help reduce that cytokine storm, which is probably what's killing most of the people. Yes. But there's still resistance because uh, it's, it's very inexpensive. Um, and, 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 you know, anybody knows if you go into, the, into a pharmacy, pick up a bottle of vitamin C. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's almost free. <laughs> it's so inexpensive and you're not going to see the stock market jumping with joy when somebody <laughs> proves that vitamin C is going to, you know, help COVID-19 patients. Well, less Dr. Moss, you've seen on TV, there's nothing on, 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 they'd say about washing your hands, which is okay about the mask, all that things will, you know, diminish exposure. Yes. But once you're exposed, nobody talks about optimizing your immune system, how vitamin C can optimize uh, the Th1 level that's probably unbalanced with Th2 and these and most of the people that get the virus, they don't talk about how you can enhance the cellular reaction against viruses with, with vitamin C. Uh, and and, and the, main th the main thing is that all type of white blood cells, macrophages, lymphocytes, neutrophils, all really depend on the quantity of vitamin C. They have these receptors, these GLUT receptors, and what it does, it, it in, in the presence of oxygen, vitamin C produces a peroxide, and that's the the back the, these lysosomes that kill bacteria and kill viruses, which is our first sign of defense. Depends on vitamin C, so that's important of vitamin C. There's other vitamins that are important. I mean, they have a synergistic effect in general. If you look at that, you need all of them, you know, in order to have this mosaic of of synergistic effects. But if I'm going to choose one of all the vitamins against this uh, viral or against any disease, I would choose vitamin C first. Mm -hmm. What do you think would be uh, the optimum dose for people who are not sick, let's say from a prevention point of view? What do you think would be the optimum well, in, dose? Well, well, we're, we, we came out with a, with a protocol, uh, a preve which is preventive, but it also has different... Uh, uh, like when people are infected, uh, when people are probably positive, but not really having symptoms, mm -hmm. when people already start having symptoms, when people get complicated, we came up with a protocol of that. And mm -hmm. what we're saying in these times, we, we kind of uh, think that at least one, two, one gram three times a day would help a lot. And, mm -hmm. and we think it's because we have to saturate, kind of try to saturate all the absorption all the, all the sites of absorption that we can in order to have a little bit of it, uh, you know, circulating. The thing is having it three times a day, it's because it's water soluble. So if you want to have at least some circulating in the blood, you need to take it up at least three times a day. And, what do you and think, the point what about, is that- What about time release or sustained release? What, what you know, I'm not sure if the time release will really have enough of it to really mm -hmm. sustain it in blood. I mean, maybe Steve Hickey will probably know more about this than me, mm -hmm. but- uh, but we've seen that at least with those three, uh, you know, three doses of, of, of one gram two times a day should be enough to prevent most of the, uh, at least the complications of the disease. It, it's not going to say that it's going to prevent you from getting uh, infected, but at least I'm sure it will help prevent uh, getting complicated. Yes. And you see, most of the people who get complicated, they talk about comorbidities, which is fine. But the thing is that most of the people with comorbidities have also these uh, insufficiency or deficiency of nutrients. So mm -hmm. uh, 
I think they're all they're gonna be kind of insufficient on vitamin C, vitamin vitamin D, zinc, and probably the B complex also. So you know that's probably the the why they originate this disease in the first place. So yes. you know th these are the things that th they don't talk about on TV. They they should tell you about. I mean, if you get you know take your vitamin C, take your vitamin D, at least have a you know a, a general dosing. And because that's the only way and decrease sugar, because sugar is one of the things that diminish your immune response and it competes with vitamin C for these uh, sites in the white blood cells. So if you have too much sugar, you're not going to produce enough of these uh, lysozymes that are needed to, to kill bacteria and to disactivate these viruses. Mm -hmm. Good point. Um, getting back to the cancer uh, issue. So, you know, we talked a little bit about this mortel. Uh, study which was a mortal a mortal blow to to I think it was yeah I think it was a mortal blow to it, it. was a mortal blow definitely um, but there was also this this other paper that appeared if you remember in 1999 that you mentioned in your in your letter and I had forgotten about this until I reread your letter and that was the Goldie study and this was bizarre. oh yeah very important paper he didn't yeah. did a good interpretation of it but you know I had a chance to see him in a in a symposium and sit it was something really weird because wow. we sit we sat we, there was no transportation so we had to take a taxi and we asked him what i said i think that's dr goldie he said i have a taxi you guys want to ride with me it was wow. me and dr miranda who has worked has done a lot of work with me uh -huh. Uh -huh. and i sat at his right and dr miranda's his left and we pull out a paper that's that paper that's called uh -huh. vitamin C and cancer 25 years later yeah. <laughs> it was funny yeah. because he read all that information i said i didn't know about this <laughs> and we invited him to be part of the paper, but I think he was too scared. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. He did correct a couple of things that we refer to as research, and he did it in a good way. You know, he, uh, we put it in our paper, but he didn't want to be part of it. And later, later after that, I think he uh, he died, and so we never had I a chance to really. He committed suicide. I he did. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. too sad. But... Yeah. Uh, but he I guess um, a lot of pressures and things, but yeah. but that paper it's it's very important because he really determined that vitamin C has it used the same receptors as glucose, that it's something that cancer and cancer it was very important of using vitamin C. And nobody really understood that, you know, when tumors mm -hmm. grow, they you basically what they use is it's glycolysis, it's glucose. Uh yes. and that's the the you know, that's the reason why the ketogenic diet has been pretty successful. Yeah. Uh, that's the, the you know I wrote a theory of carcinogenesis called the bioenergetic theory of carcinogenesis and I yes. didn't know about Dr. Thomas Seifrey and Dr. Wow. Thomas Seifrey had the same idea I had I and see. it was funny because later on uh, we we had a chance to meet I think we even meet, met on online but the uh -huh. thing was that we wrote a paper then together which is called metabolic uh, mitochondrial correction which uh -huh. is a it's a real neat piece of paper because there is Garth Nicholson who. Garth Nicholson described the, the model of the of the cell membrane, mm -hmm. the mosaic model of the cell membrane. So it, it's him. It's Dr. Seifert. We have Dominique D'Agostino, which is a, a young mm -hmm. uh, researcher from the University of Florida. And uh, he has done a lot of work with the ketogenic diet and cancer. And he has used hyperbaric uh, oxygen also right. with tremendous effect on inhibiting growth. Uh, of uh, it, it, and all this revolves in that idea of cancer being a metabolic disease, which is described by Dr. Seifried in a paper. It's described by me in another paper, and we never knew about each other after yeah, that. Not, so right. we came to the same conclusions. He came to the main door. I came to the kitchen, but we came to the same <laughs> conclusions. You know. Yes, it's, I have. It's funny, I have but I, 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 it's encouraging also because we oh, see yeah. people who are thinking out of the box are thinking in a similar way. Absolutely. Um, and I do know him, and I have visited his laboratory in uh, in Boston, and we've had him on our on our podcast as well. So yeah, we're all thinking along. He's a he's a great guy. He's a great guy. He is a great guy. And I just wanted to sort of finish the Goldie story because um, what the takeaway message of the Goldie paper for, from 1999 was that. It was really bizarre because the conclusion that he reached from the fact that there was more vitamin C in the cancer cells, the conclusion he reached was that this was somehow promoting the growth of the cancer. That the, yes, that because the cancer he thought, he thought it was an antioxidant. Yeah. And he thought that would protect the cancer cell. And that's how, that's where we talk, we talked about him, about the different doses. 
and and the effect of vitamin C not being so you know the idea of being an antioxidant or prooxidant it's kind of a white and black thing and and that's not how it goes on nature things you know an antioxidant could be an antioxidant in, in one site it depends on what's there what's the environment what is the dose what is the form so it's many variables that depend on on the, the real you know metabolic effect or the or the chemical mm -hmm. effect of that molecule mm -hmm. but vitamin C and the doses when we go to very low doses it works out very well as an antioxidant but when we go to high doses it works a little bit more as a prooxidant but mm -hmm. it's it's not only the quantity of vitamin C it's the environment where it is at and that's the the neat thing about this that all these most of these nutrients work as modulators they they enhance what they have to enhance and they decrease what they have to decrease and that's that's how we that's how we got our you know that's how we can live if it would have been just one function of one molecule and yes. you know we would not be able to live we need that versatility of these very important molecules right. and uh, that's not really much understood because there's two phases of this there's a biochemical phase of these molecules but there's also an energetic phase And we we understand a bit, you know, a little bit more about this uh, biochemical one-dimensional way of looking at, at at reactions. But the energetic ones, we we're starting to understand them, and and a lot of people call it hocus pocus. A lot of people call it uh, uh, pseudo science. And the thing is that it's you know it doesn't respond to the reductionist point of view of medicine nowadays, and it doesn't respond to the Newtonian physics. It's 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 you know it's quantum physics and you know it's nobody really understands quantum physics, Dr. Moss, because even the originators, uh, Niels Bohr, Planck, they they said that, you know the first thing in 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 quantum physics is the the in uncertainty. It's uncertain. Yes. <laughs> so when you have a science based on uncertainty, you're going to have trouble having it. You know, <laughs> but you know it responds very well when you see it in 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 equations. It responds very well to experimentation, and it has yeah. demonstrated the versatility of things. Like, for example, light. It's a it's a wave. It's a particle. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, it, it's you know it's it has this versatility. And there's one saying of uh, Nikola Tesla. Yeah. He said, "If you want to know the secrets of the universe, you have to understand energy, vibration, and frequency." And I think so he was how totally you, correct. How, how do, but how does this? affect the cancer patient. We would like to take a moment to thank our Patreon subscribers for helping to make this program possible. If you would like to have access to exclusive content including transcriptions, episode recaps, and special offers, become a patron today at patreon.com slash mossreports. Most of our listeners are cancer patients or relatives yeah. of well, cancer. You know, I mean, I is, it, is it a pra can we apply the, this practically? That's an excellent question, and and you know, uh, I think one of the important things is to try. One of the things I see cancer as a damage to the mitochondria. I see cancer as a metabolic disease, and I see cancer of a disease needed of energy and information, and that's where everything kicks in. Uh, the mm -hmm. thing is. We have a dysfunctional mitochondria, so we have to look at ways how we can restore that mitochondria. And that's been what we've been looking into different type of things. We've been looking at nutrition. We've been looking at supplementation. We've been looking at different things like lasers. We've been looking at exosomes. We've been looking at everything that could contribute in some way to restore the necessary energy and information of the cell. So what we have seen to date is basically that, number one, people have to eat more natural foods in the sense of decrease or eliminate totally processed foods. That's one of the mm -hmm. things that really starts damaging the systems. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem is when you don't have enough energy, you don't have order, you don't have organization, you reduce comp compartmentalization and you lose communication. And so every cell is on its own. It doesn't work as a system anymore. It doesn't work as a mm -hmm. tissue anymore. It's mm -hmm. every cell trying to survive. So we see cancer as a survival mechanism because cells want to survive to an, an environment which is not proper for them. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, we give uh, this, this diet, which it's supposed to be, I mean, different people have, have different effects. Some people use paleo, some people use keto. But the thing is, one thing for sure, you have to reduce carbohydrate. It has to be a low carbohydrate diet. 
And one of the things, it cannot any have any refined processed carbohydrates either, or even mm -hmm. fat, because most of the fats are processed also. So you have mm -hmm. to go back, you know, to try to have all these uh, vegetables would have these different pigments that have uh, some epigenetic effects. It takes mm -hmm. time. It's gonna, not going to be an item day thing. It's going to take some time. But you start with the macro thing, which is the diet. Then you continue with selected supplementation. We think that mitochondrial enhancers, as we describe in that paper of, of mitochondrial correction, I think the, that's the main issue. But, you know, we encounter an issue that sometimes we have all these factors, all these things that are needed, but you need like a energy push, you know, like a, and something to restore information. And that's mm -hmm. why... We think this is a very important step, the diet and the supplementation, but we also think we need like a Frank, I call it a Frankenstein effect, because you remember Frankenstein was dead tissue until they had a shock of energy, a shock that, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we think that that shock of energy needed to restore that ener energetic flow, that electron flow, I think it's on the, I think we could get it by lasers, because laser, lasers are monochromatic and are coherent. So you have mm -hmm. that it, that big pulse of, of, of photons coming in, and we have a lot of receptors for it. We have it had been some of them had been described like uh, some of them in the mitochondria. But we are we are beings of light. We are energy beings. So we have you know we have the sun that we, it, that's another thing that I think is very important. The grounding. I think people should do grounding. I think people should be exposed to the to the sun because. We absorb, uh, we have different things of absorbing. We, we absorb it by the pineal gland. We absorb it. I think even the skin absorbs it and converts these energies, but we need to be more exposed to that. And, and our, the problem with that has been also, there's been a lot of contaminants, not only on foods and on water, but on, 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 on waves, you know, on, on electromagnetic contamination. That's right. been the sky contamination which prevents the, these, uh, these uh, light waves from the sun to reach our body. So it's a lot of things that we have been, you know, yes. changing and our body is resilient, but it could stand, it could withstand so much, you know? So right. we, it's kind of, you know, all these, you see these uh, older cultures, the Chinese, the Indian, the Ayurveda, all of them really understood energy and they mm -hmm. manage energy and use it to, for and we have forgotten that we we and rely mostly on the one dimensional reductionist uh newtonian uh pharmacological view which mm -hmm. is bad because pharma these most of these pharmacological things they go to one receptor they do one specific thing which may you know may help in a symptom for some time but it's going to disarray the whole metabolism because it's going to unbalance it again so that's the good thing with nature, with, with these soap and these things. They are, these are molecules that are, from, the body is familiar with them. Even to eliminate them, when you have too much of them, you don't even use energy for that. It just normally eliminates it because those are molecules that are physiologically friendly. Mm -hmm. those, when you have these molecules, that, that when you have to change them, these are pharmacological molecules, you, you need the toxification systems from the liver, uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, and that uses a lot of, metabolic steps, uses a lot of enzymes, and uses a lot of energy. So you're using energy to just eliminate those things, not using the energy to restore what you need to restore and then unbalancing. I remember having uh, my Chinese professor where I was studying natural medicine, they said that, that disease was not, it, disease didn't exist. What existed is an unbalanced, you know, uh, mm -hmm. unbalanced system. Yes. And that's the basis of, of, of most of the older cultures. Even shamans in Brazil, they don't know phys they don't know physiology, they don't know about chemistry, but they understand how the plants uses the energy. Take the take the leaves, pick the leaves in the morning, but take them in the evening because they know that these energies can vary. They have these different. I mean, they understand that that we have forgotten, mm -hmm. and I think we should go back to you know to put together you know what we know about our physical one dimensional molecules but put them together that they rely really on energy. So it's, you know, it, one thing complements the other, although we don't understand much of these mechanisms of quantum physics, but they, they are the ones that really give form to our physical world. So we have to some sometime, you know, in some way, try to make uh, this synergistic effect in order to be able to, uh, you know, uh, cure or, or uh, at, at least treat, you know, people. And, uh, well, I'll go back I don't know if I have the, the, you know, the exact uh, thing to really tell you about how we can do it in, in terms of nowadays, but I think the 
uh, uh, what I can tell you is that we have to, at least in terms of diet, come back to nature. In things of supplementation, we should use forms that are active. Uh, not necessarily they have to be natural because you, you may have a pharmacological effect. The thing is that we have to watch out because there's an imbalance and we're giving these supplements to create a balance. But some, if we restore the balance, we may have to uh, reduce the intake of these nutrients. And how we do this, we do it looking at markers of tumor markers. We look at, at different, uh, looking at metabolic products like homocysteine, uh, C-reactive protein, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So that's how we do it. Yeah. Uh, what, are, what are the mitochondrial enhancers that you mentioned? What would be some well, examples? Yes. Well, we, one of them is CoQ10, mm -hmm. alpha lipoic acid, acetyl L-carnitine, mm -hmm. magnesium, even vitamin C and B complex. Those are the most potent ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you, have you yourself uh, experienced anything in terms of the quality of the products that, that you mentioned? Do you have some? That's important also. That's very important. Uh, there, uh, what we tell our patients, we don't have a line and, you know, we don't give a specific line, but we tell them if they're going to buy something that check that the product has a, a physical address, some, somebody where you can communicate and, and to, we, we may recommend some companies or something, but the main thing is that the product has a, a, a address or so some, somebody that can, oh, you know, be, send some yeah. information to and ask them to sell, to tell, tell them, I have this product and it has this number. Uh, could you send me the report on, on your analysis report? If they say yes, where they send it, you know, the company is good. If they say they don't have it, don't buy it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah. That's a good. So every product would have an analysis report? It should. It should. And it, ha it should have a number, which it's, it has a specific name. I don't remember the name right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, that specific number, it, it's a, like a block. And that's where, you know, they should have different batches. And that batch in particular, every time they do a new batch, they should have an analysis for it of purity, right. microbial, all that sort of things. Right. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, you just get the door slammed in your face when you do this, but then it's time to move on. Uh, I, I was looking into, um, I was interested in um, a, pro a product. It's a, it's a pre it's kind of a prebiotic, um, and that's a roasted chicory root. And I went to the person, the company that's been supplying that probably supplies most of the most of the uh, natural food stores and co-ops. And they just turned me down flat. Wouldn't tell me how long it had been, you know, cooked, roasted for, or anything like that, which could affect the ab ability of that to act as a prebiotic for the for the yeah that yeah flora. that's you know, a so bad sign <laughs> a very bad sign and they told me not to trade secret <laughs> well it's a secret they're keeping from the consumer who might be uh, and i use their products myself you know and they might be just wasting their time energy and and money and buying money. something so this is a very big problem i would say because the real not that i want there to be more regulation in the field of supplements but i'd like there to be more self-regulation in the field and you get you know an uneasy feeling that um a lot of people just don't care and all they care about is making quick buck and uh the field is flooded with you know these bad bad players but i would say flooded but there's certainly a an element of that you know most of them are good actually yeah. but but there are a few bad apples yeah. we have you know? checked about you know companies that are uh are you know frequent at the malls and stuff like that yeah, and yeah and most of those are kind of okay you know yeah. yes. some better than others but but they're at least they they should do their job uh yes. but we've seen some in supermarkets and uh, which are not too reliable are very inconsistent right. in terms of results yes and uh, what do you think in terms of the larger question of the the relationship of these natural products to conventional cancer treatment, like chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, even immunotherapy. I mean, this came up, of course, in the vitamin C question where Gold, the people who were at least in, well, Goldie himself was claiming 
it wasn't his phrase. It was somebody else at Memorial Sloan Kettering said that vitamin C would make cancer explode and explode <laughs> not in the good sense of being, you know, being yeah. destroyed, well, but in the know, sense I it would make it spread. I, it's too bad because they don't understand the biochemistry of vitamin C. And, you know, if you look at the literature, I mean, they, there's so many, even at the in PubMed, you see more than thousands of articles on vitamin C. And you see that I would tell you that probably 95% are positive. You know, they, they might be one or another that are not. Yes. But, the, you know, the the main evidence is that it, it, it it's, It could work synergistically with many of these uh, chemotherapeutics r regimes, mm -hmm. and that in, by its and some people who cannot get any chemotherapy are responding very well just to vitamin C alone. You know, when, mm -hmm. when it's given in the proper dosage and in, in the proper form. Well, what uh, about other things though, like nu nutraceuticals, uh, like curcumin and um, uh, things, resveratrol, and these other things? And sometimes you you hear hear yeah. said, you know, doctors will tell the patients absolutely don't take any supplements because it's going to conflict with the chemo i'm wondering yeah. your well, from your experience yeah. your, from our experience your, is that it, most of i would tell you that what we have seen of the patients that are in chemo and getting our our, our protocol i mean they they're doing better than the other patients because they have less side effects and they have the same results you know they have yeah. good results and less side effects so i would say that it, it it really what it does it it benefits their quality of life it seems to be that way but, but let me tell you you know that charles simone wrote a couple papers some years ago yes. Yes. and he collected pretty much good information about sure. synergistic effects of, of vitamin c and other nutrients yes. when used together with chemotherapy Absolutely. And uh, I think that paper still stands as a, a landmark, as as does the Keith Block uh, review on the same. Oh, you know, yeah. Covering, oh, covering yeah. A lot of, same, same done a lot of good work, around. too. Yes. So, uh, but, you know, we still have this prejudice and then nobody will pay for the clinical trial to actually, usually to test these things. Although in the, uh, I wanted to ask you about the University of uh, Iowa. That, such a breakthrough, right? A couple of years ago, when they came out with the results in the pancreatic cancer, and they showed that the intravenous vitamin C basically doubled the survival time of people who were getting what was then the standard treatment for pancreatic. Yeah, that is how it's experience also. Uh huh. That basically doubles the the survival if you give people vitamin C with the with the conventional uh, therapy. But let me tell you one thing. I think the pharmacological field. It's not taking advantage of this because they would say that their product is very good and when used with vitamin C, it's better. <laughs> and they probably would be right and they would sell their stuff too. So yeah, yeah. they're not taking advantage of the, no. you know, the benefits of these of vitamin C and other nutrients. Well, I think it all goes back to polling because they don't want to admit that they were wrong. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, the data has proven them wrong and proven polling to be right. But It's uh, you know they say crow crow is not a very tasty dish to eat and <laughs> there there's a lot of a lot of crow that needs to get eaten uh, in this field because it turned But, you out know, I think I think they're not being too intelligent because uh -huh. at the end what they want to do is sell so if that makes you sell you right. should use it you know <laughs> absolutely yes and uh, I just going back a little bit to this question I, I uh, of the mitochondria. I'm not sure that all of our listeners are going to understand everything that you said, but I'll take it back to very basic that basically, I mean, when people look at cancer, they're thinking that the can cancer originates. Most people think, most scientists think it originates in the genes, in the nucleus of the cell. But then there's a minority of people like Tom Seyfried that you mentioned and yourself and, and, uh, uh, uh D'Agostino and these others who believe that cancer originates not in the nucleus, but in the body of the cell, in the cytoplasm, where the mitochondria live. And the mitochondria are these strange bacterial-like um, uh, uh, bodies that produce the energy for the cell. And we're not, you know, even if you've had high school biology, they didn't tell you just how essentially important the mitochondria are, but basically... It's about uh, that if, if 
if something disturbs the mitochondria, then you then the cell is confronted with a choice of either dying or flipping over into a very primitive system of of energy generation. Did I get that exactly. right? Yeah. Oh, so, exactly. So basically, you mentioned you you said something in um, in one of your papers that it's a word that I've used, um, but I I do it. I do it carefully because I haven't really seen anybody else talking about it. And that's the word redifferentiation. And oh, I, yeah. I really, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a prohibited word, word it, in it conventional is. medicine. <laughs> well, why don't you explain what, what that actually means? What is it? What is yeah. it? Well, what, it's that? very simple. What we think, think is that uh, the cell, uh, when the cell starts uh, damaging itself and converting to a, uh, a different uh, a cancer cell it basically uh undifferentiates it becomes like a primitive cell and mm -hmm. what we want to do is restore uh, that information in order to have it convert again to what it's supposed to be if it's a liver cell or liver cell so if a uh uh so it, ha it has some characteristic of that tissue but it abandons a lot of the different characteristics mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what we want to do is provide the necessary cofactors that would enhance the probability of that returning to its normal state of a differentiated state. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're using this, these diets and these uh, cofactors. But we think we need a little bit, a little push, a little more push. So we're looking into laser, speci specifically intravenous laser therapy. We're looking also into specific exosomes that uh, of a specific point of time where you have differentiating factors in these exosomes that would probably provide the necessary information to give that final push to the cell to go back where it's supposed to be. Okay. Do you see any substances that might redifferentiate? In other words, what that essentially means is healing the cancer instead of just killing the cancer. Right, because we yeah. well, take I a think, cell that's, I think that's it's abnormal. A, yeah, it's it complicated in the sense that uh -huh. you have these uh, metabolic effects, but at the same time, uh, once these metabolic effects go for a period of time, they do influence the genes. So you have yeah. a you have a change in genes, but I don't I won't say it's a mutation per se. I, it looks more like an epigenetic effect, yeah. and so we want to do another epigenetic effect to restore the old. Uh, gene the genes that are differentiation genes right and right so, so yes there could be you know, I, I don't think we're there yet but but we're, we're getting there we're getting there yes uh, and, i think and, most i think the important things is to to try to uh correct metabolism we call it metabolic correction and i think it's uh, basically it's kind of the scientific explanation of orthomolecular medicine uh -huh. and right now the clinical aspect of orthomolecular medicine is functional medicine so everything is kind of you know getting to its place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing with this is that it's something that's going to work it works slowly you're change you're going to the root of the problem so you're not going to have a a quick uh solving effect it's going to take some time but it goes to the root of disease you know if if you respond well to it you're going to be okay you know but Right now, we cannot give any guarantees, but but one guarantee I could give if if somebody follows these protocols, their quality of life is going to improve. I cannot really assure them that we're going to save them that uh, and that sort of thing. But our experience is that people uh, have a, a better, much better quality of life, and also that they most of the time uh, we seen that they surpass whatever their physician told them that they were going to live. Mm -hmm. We had a we had a patient with a, with a metastatic prostate cancer, which he marked cancer in every part of his body, Dr. Moss. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. I thought we were not going to be able to help him. He was he, he was given a three-month, uh, you know, life. Uh, mm -hmm. Expect, and expect, expectation. Expectancy, yeah. And, and what happened is that he was five years with us, and he, and he, he, was, he, he lost, he was uh, very thin. He was gray in color. He was using a, a, a walking device to help him walk. And he started exercising. He gave 20 pounds. His color changed. And, and he died 
five years later because he was not doing the stuff because his wife got sick and he got depressed and he didn't come back. So I don't know if he would have continued with the with the program if he would have still been alive. I don't know. But at least he was given three months and he lived five years with good quality of life. I remember so, he's saying that one of the things that he wanted to do is go and ski with his uh, with his uh, grandsons. Mm -hmm. And and he did. He had a chance to do that. That's great. Uh, where is these? Pro where is the protocol? Is that published anywhere? The protocols that you mentioned? Well, we uh, partially in those papers in the uh, metabolic correction, but uh, we have a book. It's called uh, "I Have Cancer." What should I do? Mm -hmm. It's there, but I mean, the, you, you don't really have to buy the book. If you write me an email, I'll send you the the basic okay. of the protocol. Right. Uh, because my I mean, my idea is to help people. You know. Yes. And uh, it, it, it's available. Uh, uh, you know, for anybody, I'll give you my email. It's Michael dot gonzalez with a z at the end number five at upr.edu and, and everybody's welcome to write to me and i could send them the papers i could right. send them the protocols and it's 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 been a collection of things that, of all the stuff that uh we we've been that, that we have had uh you know good results with so it's a I, you know it's a combination of many things yeah. that uh papers from uh from all sorts of, 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 we have put together that information, make it in a kind of a uh, user-friendly form so everybody could, could kind of use it and have pretty good results. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Great pleasure to, to talk to you. Haven't seen you in a Oh, in a it's been an time. honor for me to talk to one of my heroes. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Thanks so much. Well, maybe we, maybe we can get back in touch with you in a little while and in the post-COVID era, and we'll, who knows, maybe we'll even have a visit in beautiful... Puerto Rico. So thank Great, you so thank much. you. Dr. Moss. Talking to Michael J. Gonzalez. Thank you for listening to The Moss Report. Visit our website at themossreport.com and subscribe to hear more discussion of cancer treatment options, alternative research, and more. For more information about Dr. Moss and his work, including scheduling phone consultations, go to mossreports.com.